Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Audubon Society of Central Arkansas's monthly meeting. I'm Dan Scheiman, the vice president. Tonight, our speakers are Sarah and Jody Morris. Sarah is the internal communications and health literacy coordinator for the Arkansas Department of Health. Prior to joining the Department of Health in 2018, she was a newspaper journalist and freelance writer for more than 10 years. She's a member of the Junior League of Little Rock and Arkansas Audubon Society. Jody Morris is retired as a park ranger from the National Park Service. She retired in 2018. She's still an adjunct instructor in history and geography for UAPB and Philander Smith College. She's a Central Arkansas Master Naturalist. Um, it's also a volunteer with the Central Arkansas Trail Alliance, Friends of the Washita Trail, and is completing a fellowship with America Walks. Tonight, they're gonna to be sharing scenes and stories from their recent trip to Africa. So let me share the screen and take it away. Okay, can you unmute us? You're unmuted. You're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Jody, and um, I agreed to do most of the speaking, but Sarah's going to handle any bird questions, okay? <laughs> and just to note, we're not mother and daughter. Um, Sarah is my brother's oldest daughter, and um, the uh, so that's I'm her aunt. She's my niece. So uh, that's how we're related. And you can go to the second slide. Dan, can you go to the next slide? I'm trying. <laughs> okay. Well, you were doing this before. Okay. Well, well, I'll explain how we got, while he's uh, figuring that out, um, how we got started and um, in, in this trip. And um, uh, as he explained, I'm an interpretive uh, park ranger, not a law enforcement park ranger. I did. Um, interpretation exhibits, um, uh, taking care of museum objects and collections, and uh, a lot of education, working with school groups uh, from kindergarten through college, and as well as adult learning groups. And so um, the uh, association that I belong to, the National Association for Interpretation for uh, park naturalists, historians, uh, museum docents, um, zoo curators, um, is something I've been uh, uh, belong to for 30 years. And uh, the uh, and the group that we went with, it was um, 10 people, and they all belonged to this association. And uh, they were in different fields. Right. Um, for example, um, Tim Merriman and uh, Lisa Brochu put the trip together. They were the ones that proposed we go and invited people to come with them. And uh, they were a president and vice president of the National Association for Interpretation for many years, um, as well as um, previous Nature Center directors and interpreters and museum uh, interpreters and planners um, in their previous career. So our uh, goal was to go and see as much wildlife yeah. as possible and then to experience different cultural events. Right. And uh, so we had a, a very people with mixed backgrounds. Some had worked at zoos, aquariums, museums, naturalists. All of us have a love for the outdoors and love travel. And so it was just kind of a natural fit. We started planning this and our uh, Tim and Lisa proposed a trip to see who'd be interested in going along in the fall of 2019 with the plan of going in either the the um, the fall of 20 or spring of 21. And then of course, uh, we got in our a group of uh, maximum of 12 was what they were looking for. We ended up with 10 and uh, because COVID hit. <laughs> and so that postponed it a year. And so the plan was to go in then in fall of, of uh, 21 or spring of 22. And we ended up opting for spring of 22. And then of course, uh, the new variant hit in uh, late 21, and we debated about whether to postpone another year or not, but um, that actually we were going to East Africa and that variant developed in South Africa and uh, the two countries that we were planning to go to, uh, Tanzania and Rwanda, um, had had very tight control, uh, extremely high vaccination rates, and um, they had very little incident um, with the um, 
I forget the name of the variant, but the, the variant that came out late 21. But um, so they said, come now, because we don't know when the next variant is going to come up. If you postpone it to next fall, then something else may come up by then. And actually, so, if you go to the next slide. Actually, if you don't mind, I might. Well, let's put, uh, let's uh, hang oh, on just a second. Deborah, the video that was, um, the photo that was labeled drum orders in Arusha, I had switched the um, photo and. Oh, that's actually, uh, uh, which of the weavers? And it, it was a weaver. It was, I think a village weaver that I forgot to switch the caption. Thank you for catching that. Thank but you. Um, we have in that, first picture on the left and we went to a beer making a banana beer making class so they had us it wasn't a really class it, we were actually helping a family prepare their uh banana beer which they use for celebrations weddings any special occasion and so we were invited to their home to actually help them it's a homemade brew and uh it is fermented but we can talk about so more. we get that <laughs> we'll talk about that later because that came towards the end of the trip um, but these are just different experiences that we have and um some different just to give you a little result. preview but if you go to the next slide um if you don't mind dan do you mean just say it in the chat when to go to the next slide to say next it'll be easier next. okay um, in this picture, uh, Lisa is the woman in the purple. Again, she was one of the coordinators, main coordinator of the trip, putting the logistics together and working with a local guide companies. And uh, for them, it's very important that our guides were um, a company owned by uh, Tanzanians and Rwandans and that, that they were all local and that this went directly to them. And um, Gabby, uh, Gabriel, uh, we, everybody calls him Gabby, is the gentleman of the khaki shirt and he is the owner and operator of what used to be known as Maasai Magic Safaris and uh, they went through a name change recently and his company is now Regal, Regal like a lion he says, uh, African Safaris and he's the, the owner of our uh, tour, tour company and uh, safari company in uh, Tanzania and they will tell you in Tanzania that you can say Tanzania or Tanzania but when we went to Rwanda, it's like they were being polite. It is Tanzania. So, <laughs> so that's how I'm going to try to remember to say it. And over on um, the right side of the screen is uh, James. And he was uh, uh, the, a tour guide working with Gabby, uh, an excellent birder. Both of them are professionals in conservation for many years and in their training uh, before they began guiding. And so they were our guides um, for this safari. One, not, one thing I kind of noticed about them is they were really knowledgeable on the birds on all the wildlife, but for birds, um, apparently they had been making some switches in the names. And so we would kind of get confused because the names that they were telling me is not were not the names that I were finding I was finding in the books our guide or books for an e or yeah. anything like that so we'd have to go back and forth sometimes and uh John Marie Wild was our uh, guide in uh Rwanda and you'll see pictures of him later uh and um uh they worked very closely together to arrange our transfer uh we flew from uh Tanzania to Rwanda um, about a little over halfway into the trip and, and switched hands with our guides. And they did a masterful job. We had to get COVID tested everywhere we went. And we had to get COVID tested on both sides in, uh, of that flight uh, from Tanzania to Rwanda. And they really did a super job of handling all that. And they did shut down all their national parks um, for um, uh, almost two years uh, during uh, COVID. And we were actually one of the first groups that their parks had just opened back up and their tourism has just started back. And um, so they're, they're desperately, this has become a huge part of their economies and they were very excited for us to come, uh, but uh, it is just restarting back there. And they're- You uh, can kind of tell in some of the parks because they said that it would used to be bumper to bumper and we didn't see as many people as there used to be maybe a year or two ago. Um, one of the national parks we visited is Serengeti National Park, which is uh, you know, known around the world and, and a, a major destination for so many people. And we saw very few other groups. So um, that'll give you a taste of that. And next. 
Okay. Uh, we landed in Arusha, uh, which is not the capital of Tanzania, but is one of their largest cities and is the airport close to Kilimanjaro. Uh, we did not go to Kilimanjaro National Park, but I, I did drink a Kilimanjaro beer, which I enjoyed very much. Um, the, uh, uh, we uh, stayed our first couple of nights in the Serena Hotel uh, to gather our group up and make sure everybody arrived and began our wildlife viewing actually right there um, at the Serena Hotel. And it is in a beautiful natural setting, um, the style done to complement local vernacular architectural styles, beautiful gardens. And uh, it is an Indian, uh, most of the hotels in uh, Tanzania are uh, owned by Indian nationals and operated. And um, the service was fantastic. Um, our accommodations would vary from plush, <laughs> very nice um, hotels like that. We stayed in three different Serena hotels in different locations. Most of the time though, we stayed in bush camps and which we loved. They were more on the glamping and yeah. I was expected a little bit more maybe a little rustic rustic <laughs> and it was not what I was expecting but they were all really nice and this was one of the um nicer ones that we yeah. stayed at I'm a regular tent camper and but I still enjoyed the glamping aspect it was very nice and this was one of the ones where um while we were kind of catching up on jet lag we would sit outside in a little right outside in a little area and pretty much all the birds were just right above us or right next to us and we arrived on March 5th and um, the uh, we were between, they don't have, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall. They have rainy seasons and dry seasons and they have a short rainy season, a short dry season, and then a, 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 a long rainy season and then a long dry season. We were on a shoulder uh, between a dry season, short dry season, getting ready to move into the long rainy season, monsoon season, which was a very good time to go. Um, one of the things that uh, they recommended is that um, the if you're planning a trip to their areas and thinking about what you want to see, and you're if you're working with local guides, they will help you determine the best times to come. Um, August, September is when the great migration across the Serengeti occurs, but there are migrations continuously um, across the Serengeti as animals shift for better feeding opportunities and, and, uh, and depending if they're, they're birthing or what stage the young may be at. So there are constant movement of herds and different species of animals. The greatest migration of the most species happens in September, October. But the babies are born in March. So we and got we, to see a lot of babies. Yes. <laughs> we saw a lot of young ones for yep. the animals and the birds. We saw a lot um, of them building nests. And that was the big thing, such and, as in the bottom right corner. And Sarah's got these, the birds labeled for you that we saw here. And these were right on the grounds of the first hotel. And um, it, we were not allowed outside the immediate hotel grounds without a guard to walk with you at night. Um, there was a lake um, close by. You could walk around on your own in the daytime, but um, the wildlife is everywhere here, not just in the parks. And so they do encourage you to be extremely careful uh, going out at night, even in the hotels, not just the bush camps. And next. So our next place was we traveled to Terengary. National Park, and I always butcher the name, so that's okay. <laughs> and it, uh, it's the third largest national park in Tanzania, and uh, not as well known as Serengeti, so it doesn't get quite as many. What it is known for are the large herds of elephants and the gigantic uh, baobab trees. And uh, that's a baobab tree in the top center photograph. And um, to give you an idea of how big, if there was a, a grown, full grown, mature elephant under that tree, it would look about the size of a dog from our perspective. Um, and if you look in the bottom right corner, uh, we stayed in the uh, Terengary Safari um, Camp Lodge, which was actually tents. And um, the, uh, that's a baby baobab tree next to the row of tents in the bottom right corner. And again, that is a young tree, not a mature tree to give you an idea of how large these are. Every part of the baobab tree is edible. Uh, the fruit, the leaves, the trunk, the roots. And the most important thing about it is it's kind of like a giant sponge. 
and the elephants in the dry seasons will actually gouge with their tusk and make big holes in the trunks of the tree to drink water because the, they soak up gallons, thousands of gallons of water and they can gouge these trees to get water from them during the dry season. Uh, these are huge trees and they look like something out of Tolkien or, or out of the other fantasy novels and movies that I've read and just absolutely beautiful. I was actually pretty excited besides the trees to see the common ostriches. We had one that would um, lay down in the dirt in the road before us and just take a dirt bath. And then uh, the amount of animals we saw was just tremendous. Everywhere we went, and they said part of that may have been because of the COVID and everything being shut down. Um, Tammy Robertson asked if the gouging hurts the trees. They do recover from it. Um, and so you'll see the scarring on the older trees where they, and of course it creates nesting and uh, shelter habitat for other species. So kind of like elephants are kind of like woodpeckers in that uh, aspect with the baobab trees. Um, the um, the variety of wildlife, and I think one of the things that surprised us throughout our trip is that we would see the species all mingled together. Um, and I think we were surprised, even predator and prey um, cohabiting so closely together. And um, everybody watches for those signs for the moment when the, the tide turns and okay, the chase is on now. But we were really surprised at how often we would see different species mingling together and interacting. And I'm not sure if we were able to include it because the video was so long, but the Cape Buffalo in the top right corner were actually, it's a pretty big herd. And we did have a young male elephant. That uh, was let's go to the next to slide them. and see if we've got that one in there. We do not. Oh, you didn't come back. Okay. Um, just a note, if y'all want to see more of these, um, uh, not long after Sarah and I returned, we had a, a death in our family. And so uh, our posting on our social media got disrupted, but we're both planning to start back with sharing more um, photos and videos and, and journals of our trip. And I have a, a Jody Morris, I have a Facebook page that is open to the public. And uh, so I'll be posting some that video. Uh, there, there was a young, immature uh, elephant. He was, he was probably about 17, 18 years old. Uh, under 25 is immature for elephants. And so he was a, an adolescent male. And he tried to intimidate a whole herd of Cape Buffalo, which are fierce animals. And uh, we'll talk about how much they're respected in just a little bit. But um, he thought he could intimidate this whole herd. And they just looked at, back at him like, it ain't happening. And he got mad and realized he had an audience <laughs> and turned and charged the Jeep that I was in. It's worth to note, Jody was in the first Jeep. I oh, was in sorry. the second Jeep. Just they weren't, watching all this happen. Uh, they're not Jeeps. They're, oh, we'll think name. of the brand name in a little bit. But anyway, they're the safari vehicles that everybody With uses. And uh, the roofs pop up so you can stand on your seats and look out and um, watch everything. And uh, he got mad and kind of took out his humiliation. Uh, he didn't actually he hit us. He almost sat on <laughs> the, the back end of our vehicle, but he gave us a, 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 a very exciting moment. And so I encourage you to go to my Facebook page or Sarah's um, Instagram page. We'll share it later. And uh, we'll share that video so you can enjoy it with us. But the driver of Jody's vehicle was just like, oh, it's okay. He doesn't mean it. He's just, he's just having a tantrum. He's not going to hurt us. And we're like, ah. We weren't so sure, but Gabby actually spent 20 years uh, specifically in conservation, working with elephant herds and researching them. And so he was very confident that we were safe. Yes. So, which he told us later. <laughs> and um, I think the largest amount of animals we saw were elephants and uh, well, lots of young ones, like you could see in the top center picture. Yeah, again, uh, we were there. We had some very tiny ones, newborns, uh, and we saw uh, young of giraffe and gazelles and all the other animals also. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Impala that's seen in the yeah. bottom left center, um, it was actually born that day that we saw it, um, yeah. just within a few hours. Uh, gazelles, and we'll, we, uh, we'll show some of the other animals as we go along. Next. 
Oh, uh, one note on the giraffes. Um, the interesting thing you can, the trees that they like to graze on, a lot of acacia trees, both the elephants and giraffes like to graze on those. And they'll, they'll actually kind of like a, um, bonsai uh, groomers that they'll change the shape of the canopy of the tree depending upon if they're how old the tree is if they're grazing on the top or grazing on the sides or grazing from underneath so it can have a flat plate shape or a uh, flat uh, a bowl shape upside down bowl shape uh, on the on the trees that you're seeing with the giraffe underneath it um, or a concave shape um, all depending on where the giraffes are grazing from recording in Progress. Okay, we had a, there we go. Uh, if, if you can go to the next. So we stayed at Here a safari go. lodge um, right at the National Park. And these were tents. And uh, if, if um, I grew up uh, and, and was a counselor at Girl Scout camps that had canvas tents on platforms, uh, if you've ever stayed at Lake Catherine State Park, you may have stayed in one of their cabin tents um, the, uh, that are canvas. And so the front part of this tent was like that. It had a thatch roof over it. It did have a concrete foundation. And then, but at the back, um, there was a dressing room and a shower and a flush toilet. And we did only have uh, water like from six to 10 in the morning and from six to 10 in the evening. And we only had electricity from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Solar energy was used to power the safari lodge. Um, the only where they had more power was at the uh, um, um, the main the main office and where there was the restaurant and lounge and everything and they had a charging station at the lounge where you could go to recharge your phones and camera batteries and things like that so we did not have places to plug in um, at this particular place um, in fact most of the bush camps you had to go to a central place to go to a charging station and recharge so it the, was a permanent yeah. lodge so the tent stayed in place uh, and we had wildlife that did come up and visit our tents, um, such as the <laughs> top two pictures on the left and center. Our baboons. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the owl and uh, over the, and that was actually by the pool. This was one of the few um, lodges or uh, bush camps we went to that did have a swimming pool and uh, it was very comfortable in a palm tree uh, right next to the swimming pool. And the bottom, it is the African scope style. The top one is a madge. Sorry. Um, that I put the, the labels go. got mixed. Uh, and there is a next to the owl is a mongoose. And those are not native to the area. They're invasive and they're quite common. And next to that's the splendid starling, which is very splendid in appearance. Um, and as common as our starlings here, but the splendid starlings, I think are native to Tanzania. Yes. Yeah. So uh, you can go ahead and go uh, and see, uh, uh, again, the, the tents are very comfortable. They do have mosquito netting around the beds um, and we're screened in as well as having the canvas, waterproof canvas flaps that you could drop down for privacy if you wanted. Uh, but you could hear the animals walking around at night, including warthogs, lions, uh, a lot of the uh, hooved animals, uh, uh, the antelope, the dick dicks, which are the very small ones, um, and you could hear them going around your tent at night. And uh, you can go ahead and go to the next. Um, we visited, uh, our, our guides were wonderful about also helping us understand the culture of Tanzania, which has many different ethnic groups um, and uh, a lot of uh, most of the country is rural and so this was a small village um, kind of a gateway village to the national park and uh, they have an art cooperative there uh, and we enjoyed visiting and purchasing souvenirs from the art at local, have, all local artists sorry <laughs> they did have over 100 um, different tribes represented at this village yeah. And um, they also uh, gave us a tour of their banana plantation. They also have a coffee plantation and um, they prepared a meal for us. Local village women uh, cooked dinner for us. On the bottom left corner, you can see their kitchen. 
So um, if any of you are into cast iron cooking when you camp, uh, they, this is similar to what they had clay bowls and cast iron um, that they were cooking meals in. And we had, there. they have cooking bananas um, and plantain, several different types of, of, I forget, something like 70 different varieties of bananas. There's a, many different ones and they're prepared different ways. Um, corn is used a lot there. Uh, rice and corn are both things that you'll see at almost every meal. Uh, some of the greens and um, the uh, uh, other local vegetables, you see a lot of potato dishes and everything too. A lot of beans, um, uh, lentils. Um, and uh, so this is very typical of what they would cook in their own village for a dinner. Next. And uh, that was the lodge there. And if you, and, and when I did this picture, just looking at it on my iPad screen, um, very dark skies, the stars were very bright. And if y'all look close, you can actually see, um, I think it's Orion that we could see in that particular picture, uh, but the very dark skies. So that was something else we really got to appreciate while we were there is the lack of light pollution. Um, and again, in that village, you know, it's pretty much lights out. If you have any electricity or solar power, it's on for just a few hours a day and then it goes off. So you have a very dark sky, which was very enjoyable. And we next went to, I'm gonna let you pronounce. Uh, Ningorongoro uh, is um, a conservation area that is not within, but is adjacent to um, the, the national park. And um, it is one of the largest calderos or, or volcanic craters in the world. Um, it has been dormant for mm, centuries. And um, if y'all are like me and grew up watching Tarzan movies on the Sunday matinee, you may remember the Tarzan movie about going to look for the elephant graveyard. Ningorongora Crater is that elephant graveyard. And that would be the, we spent all the next day, we got up before dawn, uh, loaded up in the land cruisers, thank you, I think that's what they're called, <laughs> and went down into the crater, which was a big descent. I want to say it was... But before we get there, mm -hmm. um, this screen, this is just where our hotel overlooked the crater. Right. And then if you go next... The lodge was on the rim, and so down below us in that picture of Sarah and I, uh, the crater was actually down below us. And we went down through the crater to the bottom and spent the entire next day. We had a picnic brunch and a, and a picnic lunch dinner and uh, spent the whole day in the crater to give us as, as much sightseeing, uh, wildlife viewing time as we could. And um, the crater is like a big plain down the bottom, although there are a few areas on the sides. It's forested on the sides of the crater, on the slopes as you descend down. And then when you get down to the crater, it's more of a, a savanna-like area. And there is a large lake um, at one end of the crater. Uh, we saw an incredible number of species here. And, um, and in fact, between here and the next day, uh, we, would, we'll, we would see what we call the big five. And on our next uh, couple of slides coming up, we're gonna talk about what the big five are. Uh, but in this one, uh, you can see one of the weavers, one of the most common, there's several different weavers um, in uh, uh, Tanzania, um, and they make baskets that look like little woven baskets that hang down. And there are a wide variety of colors. Um, they tend to group uh, by species in the same in tree or close to each other. So you don't usually see just one of a species, you, you usually see several. And they were very bold. Um... They had come right up to our plates trying to steal from us. Um, Joe had some pictures where I'm looking at one bird in the vehicle um, trying to get a picture, and there's one right above me just looking at me that I was completely missing. And they, they come visit us in the vehicle. Um, we also had, um, I was impressed by the amount of animals that mingled together and the amount of birds that I saw. Um, I love the flamingos that were in the bottom left and then the pod avocets. And in the top center, those are hyenas laying um, on the savanna. And back behind them are a huge flock of flamingos just 
eating away, um, uh, very unconcerned about the predators right behind them. And again, that was something we would see over and over again. Um, and, and we did see um, hunts, we did see um, animals um, enjoying the prey that they had caught. And if you go to the next slide. Oh, wait, just a minute. Oh, Let's sorry. this point out that we did see elephants here. And again, this is known as the elephant graveyard. And um, there is, you know, that's, it, it, was it legend or is it true? But there have been large remains of elephant skeletons and uh, a large older elephants have been deserved migrating in and a lot of the herds migrate through the crater um, at different times of year but but don't stay then we'll move on and many of the elders as they reach the end of their lifespan will will then stay in the crater stop at, at a migration and just spend the remaining days in the crater um, so uh, again they have a, a it, it's bountiful you have a lot of resources available to you uh, both grassy areas forested areas on the edges uh, a large lake that has water in it um, some places uh, year round. And so um, this is kind of a comfortable place for them to stay and, and go. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll see a cheetah. And uh, our guides uh, commented just how lucky we were. We saw so much and so soon within just the first couple of days, our trips, I mean, we had checked off uh, uh, so many of the species that were on our our list and we did get the big five which we'll talk about later yeah. uh, in the bottom left uh, if those look kind of like razorbacks to you um, running um, those are uh, warthogs which i kept calling hogwarts and i i still have to catch myself to keep myself from saying hogwarts and big harry potter fan uh, but these were two of the most handsome that i saw at the beautiful manes that they had we saw them everywhere in both countries and often with litters with them uh, so uh, very healthy herds of them uh, and we, we did see they can be prey. Uh, and so we saw that as well. Okay, next. <laughs> I got ahead of myself because the top center photo, um, there were hyenas that were approaching these wildebeest. Uh, or no, these are Cape Buffalo. Cape Buffalo. And we couldn't figure out what was going on until we finally realized that there was a baby laying on the ground and the mother that was the one closest to the hyena would let the hyena approach and actually touch the baby and then she'll just run and charge after the hyena. And this happened back and forth. And we thought that the baby had died until we realized that it just started moving and finally got up. I think the herd was like that too. They were kind of waiting to see if it would be, it was just born and had not stood up yet. And uh, so they were waiting to see if it would make it or not. And if it, if it had not been, had the strength to stand, they would have left it there. Um, uh, Gabby explained, James explained to us, they would have left it there for the hyenas. Uh, the, they guarded it um, and waited to see, gave it time to stand up. Once it stood up, they circled it and did protect it. So it was interesting for them to, you know, circle of life for their, uh, their approach to it. They didn't chase the hyenas off until um, it, the, the calf began to struggle and, and began to, to try to stand up. Uh, we did actually get to see it stand up and move. And we were there between five to 10 minutes, just yeah. watching and trying to decide who was going to win. So... And again, you can see some of the variety of birds that we saw. And um, again, at the time of year we were there, uh, we were past the, the, it was the short dry season and they'd had a, a good rain during the last rainy season. Um, so uh, it wasn't terribly muddy or anything. We would get occasional showers, but we, we, it did not rain most of the time we were there. We actually had very nice weather for the majority of time that we were there, very comfortable weather. And, um, the, um, the, but there was plenty of water. So we were able to see the elephants bathe, uh, to see them splash and play and uh, uh, animals coming down to the water hole. Um, the, uh, we saw waterfowl, shorebirds, as well as uh, birds of prey, like the auger buzzard. And, um, and then you can see some young zebras down in the bottom left corner. The black kite, what do you say it was about the same size as Maybe a little bit larger than the Mississippi. Yeah, I'd say so. So next. Oh, the hammer cop down on the bottom. 
to me looks like a prehistoric bird <laughs> and a uh, pterodactyl. Uh, so very interesting bird to see. We did see it both in Tanzania and Rwanda. And we saw the nest more in Rwanda. Next. Pretty cat, Dan. <laughs> there you go. So we had a lot of inter well interactions with animals uh, that were not planned. Um, while we were in the crater, we actually had an outdoor lunch prepared for us. Uh, we actually had two picnics that day. Yes. Again, a, a brunch that was on the edge of a lake where hippopotamus was, were blowing and snorting and groaning and rolling. And uh, a lot of shorebirds there and storks uh, that would walk right up to us and snatch stuff out of your hands if you didn't watch it. Um, and then a lot of other, uh, the weavers and other birds that would fly right into our vehicles, uh, sit on our stump or Sarah's camera. <laughs> but for the, <laughs> I love the left picture because we were just eating and I can't think it was Joe. She got up from the table and she came back and made a noise. And then someone else on the staff noticed the serval that had just walked out of the bushes by where the oh, food no, was prepared. Oh, no, I turned back and, and it was yelled you, it. wasn't it? Yeah, I was, I was excusing myself to go to the ladies' tree and uh, turned back to, to say something. And the serval was walking right beside our, they had set up a nice shade for us. It was a sunny day, one of our warmer days. And the serval just casually walked by. And all of us, I think, even the cat were just like surprise we yeah. all just stood there for a moment before and a serval is an african wild cat uh, about the size of a bobcat a good size bobcat uh so one of the smaller wild cats in africa uh and we we got to see them a couple of times um we at this picnic spot was right on the edge the savanna to one side of us and the forest to the other side that the serval's heading into uh, we did see black rhinoceroses in the you can crater. Go next. Oh, sorry. Next, you moved up. <laughs> sorry. Uh, these are the African black rhinos, and this actually part of the big five for Africa. Uh, the, the big top five animals. So he's our first big five. Our, our next um, four slides will be the remaining big five, and the big five refers to the animals that when when. Africa for, for ecotourism or, or was really hunting tourism and the days when Ernest Hemingway and, and others went there to hunt uh, and I know people still do go but the days when most of the people who traveled to Africa were on the hunting safaris and the the goal was to get uh, the these five species and these were considered some of the most um, um, dangerous of the five species and so therefore you know, hunters, would, this was, you know, you're a real hunter if you can bag these five. And we and, saw them pretty quick and, early in our tour. And interesting, none of the big five seemed interested in us at all. <laughs> and so none of them threatened us. Uh, we didn't have any um the again we had elephants and a baboon and we had a we had some we had we'll mention some other incidents along the way but uh none of these big five ever charged us or indicated any real interest I actually wanted the elephant but the but that's not a big five. Oh, yeah. okay yeah. so <laughs> the rhino um our guides were really um surprised because we went down in the crater and within that morning we saw three or four or more um, rhinos in the distance, but they were close enough that we were able to get pictures like these, pretty good look at them, but um, usually they're further back and more difficult to spot. Is that an ox pecker? And um, we, do, we did see um, ox peckers, um, the red build and the yellow build on the back of some of the animals, like you can see on the run on the left. And again, those are the land cruiser vehicles that we that we travel in in the back. And we're running out of time. You can go to so the next. next. Yeah, we'll speed it up. So uh, y'all may have guessed this is a leopard. And uh, they are one of the most difficult ones to see because they are secretive. They like to stay in the brush, in the trees. And so of, of all the big cats, they're the hardest one to spot. Uh, and we got lucky and had some very good sightings of them. This one was a male that was, um, we actually came up yes. <laughs> and spotted two. They were mating in the bush. This one came out, lay down, and then went back in the bush. And we the bushes shook and we heard noises. And then he'd come back out and 
take a rest and a breather and then he'd go back in the bush and that happened a few times and you can go to the next uh, these are the, we saw tons of lions and um the female lions in the top right are uh were they eating, um, I think it was a warthog, wasn't it? I think we decided warthog. Warthog. We saw uh, uh, lions that had, lionesses that had successfully taken down prey more than once. In this particular case, I think they were eating a warthog. There's a cub up in the tree, uh, a full grown female lion uh, in the tree on the bottom left. And if you look to her right, you will see a cub on a lower branch and a cub, another cub on an upper branch. And there's actually another cub up above that. And to her left, there are more grown lions. There are actually probably uh, seven or eight lions in this one tree. And all of these, the besides the ones of the lions eating, the others were all actually taken at the same time within minutes of each other. They're the same pride. But we saw different groups of lions every place we went. And uh, you can see a male and female down at the bottom. Uh, the males usually are separate uh, and from the the females, but they'll they'll hang out with them occasionally a little bit to the side. And then uh, these two apparently uh, were, she was receptive to him being nearby. And, and you can go to the next. Again, this was baby season. Um, it was the elephants. I was the, I, the hippos and elephants. Okay, uh, uh, elephants are in the big five. And we saw large groups everywhere, tons of babies, which was amazing. And you can go to the next. These are the Cape Buffalo again, and um, uh, you can see those long horns and they don't back down from very much as we saw. We got to witness that both with the hyenas, with the elephant and with some other predators as well. And you can go to the next. So we had two optional um, trips that um, Jody and I took advantage of all the options. But one, um, I'll let you explain. Uh, the, this is Ogilvy Gorge, and I have a master's in anthropology. And the first park I worked at was Park and Archaeological State Park in Park in Arkansas. And so this was a must stop for me. Um, Ogilvy Gorge is where Mary and uh, um, with a little help from her husband, uh, Louis Leakey, uh, made one of the uh, first really major discoveries of early human skeleton skeletons in Africa back in 1959. And they are still making new discoveries here all the time. And uh, looking at um, some of our, our uh, fellow uh, creatures. And uh, uh, we and I enjoyed the they had a wonderful museum to go through. It was uh, kind of an indoor outdoor museum with exhibits with some replicas of some of the skeletal remains, fossil skeleton, uh, fossilized skeleton finds um, in the center where you can see Sarah looking out is uh, there's a huge gorge uh, that sweeps through here at times the water rushing through and so you have a, an eroded remnant out in the middle and a, a lot of the excavations have been around that kind of pedestal standing up in the center. Um, we had a, a local who gave us the history of the Leakey's discoveries there and an update and actually one of their descendants is one of the active researchers there today. And you can go next. Uh, we also got to visit a Maasai village, and again, there, there are several hundred ethnic groups in Africa, but probably the best known are the Maasai, and actually Gabby um, is of Maasai heritage. Um, and what we learned, uh, we actually had an, another guide a little later on that uh, is also a Maasai, and uh, part of the year he's in um, a ranger type uniform as a guide, and part of the year he's in traditional warrior dress uh, when he's back in his village. And so um, the some Maasai practice a traditional life, a herding cattle um, year round. Um, others go back and forth between um, urban life or modern jobs and life in the village, and they tend to change their clothes with where to adapt to where they are. And Stephen, the guide we met that regularly goes back and forth, said it helped him get you know reset. You know where am I now? And what are the rules here? And the bottom um, center picture to the left, they invited us into their homes. And we got to see each um, one of us went individually 
with a, a member of the village into their home. So each of us went in a different home and um, they don't have windows. Um, mine had a fire lit and yours did. Some of the others did not. And if they have, if the man had more uh, than one wife, each wife had their own home. That's a rule that is strictly enforced. Um, since we have 12 you, minutes, we yeah, we'll go keep going. Uh, they do have a, I'll just point out, they do have a school in the village. And one of the things we found in Rwanda and in um, Tanzania, both right now, is that really emphasizing that all youth be education, educated. Um, they had a one room schoolhouse that actually, the, it, it consists of the sticks. That's the room. It's not a solid wall. And they have a partial chalkboard. These children are trilingual. They speak English, they speak Swahili, and they speak Ma or the what Maasai means uh, people who speak, speak Ma. And so they are trilingual at least already at their age of seven, eight. Um, and if you, yeah, go ahead next. and go to the next slide. Um, the, uh, um, the next place we went, we actually went to the village on our way to the Serengeti. And, and this is Serengeti National Park. And uh, so this is the Great Savannah um and huge vast where you you don't see any towns of uh, uh uh human occupation um and we we're excited to see uh, the lions in the top left where there were zebras back behind that were just watching them and the lions were just sleeping they did not care but and that is a drain pipe that the lions chose to sleep in um uh, they, uh, it was beside, we were about to cross uh, a little uh, a stream, a seasonal stream that apparently during the rainy season gets much larger. And uh, they were getting ready to replace the drain across. And these are dirt, dirt roads um, that the safari land cruisers travel on as well as the rangers and uh, conservation staff. Uh, there's a herd of zebra back behind that. And again, they're actually, several female lions laying in that low grass, blending in between the herd of zebra and the males at the drain pipe. And again, zebras are very curious. You never see them without seeing other species around them and even very close to predators with oh, seeming little me. concern. Five minutes. Yeah. Uh, so I want to point next. out the, uh, uh, down in the lower right is uh, uh, a Top. topi. Uh, T-O-P-I, and uh, it is almost a blue jean color sheen on its hide, and that's a male buck uh, up on an ant mound, termite mound. Um, the, Sarah has the others labeled. Again, you can see the ox packers on the neck of the giraffe. Okay, yeah, next. next. We uh, stayed in the bush camps in uh, two different bush camps in the Serengeti, and they were our favorite places we stayed. In the top right picture, um, that is uh, Lizer, who is a Maasai warrior. And you can tell he wouldn't be able to wear that sword on his side. Notice he's got a cell phone next to it and he had a radio also. Um, we had lions come into the camp at night. Um, we had a hyena come up and still one of our um, fellow travelers. Keen shoes. sandals. <laughs> so she had to borrow um, shoes to so if you needed to go to the lounge uh to get your batteries at night you would radio the um office and they would send one of the warriors to come escort you to the lounge or coming to dinner if it was after dark we got in late one night uh from our early you know just like here sunrise sunset are the best times we did do a couple of night safaris next So our next area. Uh, Nuduchu is an area um, in the South Serengeti. Um, as we were um, on our way um, um, out of the Serengeti, um, again, another area, uh, there's a, a river that goes through this section. Um, and there was a, one area where we saw a number of vultures uh, uh, gathered in one spot, a uh, water spot. Uh, the, um, again, uh, many different, another pride of lions, a different group, uh, tortoise, uh, land tortoise, and um, <laughs> guinea, which I'm like, oh, y'all got guinea here too. And it's like, oh yeah, they're from here. Yeah, <laughs> so. And if you go to the next, this is actually the place where we had a hot air balloon ride. Safari. Was, safari, and it was amazing. 
to uh, say all the wildlife. Um, Zomu, uh, Zumo is our, was our pilot on this flight. And this is where we got to have that experience of the great migration. And that's actually a video on the right that you would see um, a mixed herd of wildebeest and zebra and Cape Buffalo and uh, other animals running uh, below us uh, in the, uh, right in the shadow of our, our hot air balloon. And that was a fantastic experience. We had a perfect landing. Uh, we actually went about twice as long as we were supposed to because the weather was perfect, the conditions perfect, and the wildlife was everywhere. And uh, Zumo said it was one of the best flights he'd ever had. And it actually closed. It was a perfect closing to our time in Tanzania. To, yeah. And we went to <laughs> Rwanda after that. And if you go to the next. Um, um, we actually flew over Lake Victoria on our way to Rwanda and then landed in the capital city there, which is Kigali. And our first stop was uh, uh, the genocide memorial. And some of you may have seen Hotel Rwanda. Um, if you have not watched that movie, which is based on the actual events, I would highly recommend it. And uh, Rwanda uh, on April 7th of this year commemorated the 28th anniversary of the 94 genocide. And it was perfect to go there first because it kind of um, kept in the back of our mind. So as we were going to the different places, um, and they sometimes refer back to that. Over a million people were um, killed uh, during the genocide. Um, and um, this was not an ethnic disagreement, which I think is a misconception sometimes from those outside Africa. Um, it, this was, these were class groups created by the colonizers um, uh, um, who um, came into th this area and um, uh, French and um, I'm, my mind's know. blank, but uh, it, the uh, so they're a French speaking country. Most a lot many English is very common there also in Swahili. Um, and the one of the yeah. things that um, is important to know about the genocide is that it had a big impact on their wildlife resources and all the building destruction, uh, uh, air infrastructure destruction, um, as we see in Ukraine right now. And so that's what they experienced just 28 years ago. And if you can go to the next slide, our, our first stop and one of our main goals here was to go to Volcanoes National Park, which is now a national park, but this is where Diane Fossey um, studied the mountain gorillas and uh, before she was murdered. And uh, the gorilla family that we actually encountered on our gorilla trek um, are actually descendants of the family that she actually studied. And in fact, the head of this family was a baby that she witnessed being born and knew as an infant. Um, the uh, the this trip that we took to see the gorillas, they said that um, we had one half of our group that was supposed to do the easy hike. We were supposed to do the moderate and they said it ended up being the, hard. the hardest. <laughs> it was the most challenging hike that they've ever taken a group on. It was just because the gorillas kept moving further up the mountain and would had three days of rain. So. Um, the biopic film about Diane Fossey's Gorillas in the Mist. And so this is kind of like a, a vertical rainforest um, that you're going up a mountain through a very uh, rainforest type climate. Uh, and we had um, porters with us that were guides um, that and guards that came with us through this area because uh, it, it is wild, totally wild. And, uh, but these particular gorillas have been studied for decades now. So they're not tame by any means, but they are used to having people. And again, we had the people who knew their behavior and knew what to tell us to do to keep ourselves safe. And the people that would have been the poachers um, that actually have a pro conservation program. So uh, they were actually found a job in they were helping us carry our bags and our camera equipment up the hill mountain for us so we wouldn't have to. And they also are replanting um, Volcanoes National Park and, and uh, other national parks became sanctuaries for the Tutsis during the genocide. And so the only thing they had to survive on were the, the animals and the plants within the national parks and the parks were devastated. Um, and so they have replanted a lot of these areas and their work as conservationists now um, as guides, as guards, as researchers, and um, as landscapers, as farmers who are growing uh, crops that are suitable um, to the habitat there for the wildlife. And Dan, do we need to stop here to go for questions or would you 
Should we continue? We have just maybe five more slides. Maybe we can uh, yeah, get through the last few slides. Okay, we'll do them fast. Our second national park is you can at go the, to the next. other end of Rwanda. So we went um, all the way back through Kigali to the other side of Rwanda. And this is kind of the Rwanda side of the Ser uh, Serengeti and uh, to Akagera National Park. And this was one of my favorite places. Um, the tent lodge that we stayed at was fantastic. It was more luxury. Um, we had the monkeys everywhere just outside of our um, um, tents along with hippos and elephants. We had some night drives where we got really lucky and saw the leopard in the bottom left on the right, on the left, on the right, sorry. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, none of us was expecting and we just happened to see it. It was watching some Cape Buffalo right below it. Yeah. And uh, um, the monkeys were quite entertaining. Uh, this park is also known for its hippos and uh, the, the park is right on the edge of a lake. Um, and it's one of the larger lakes in, in that part of Africa. In fact, and I think in Rwanda, it's second only to Lake Victoria, which is forms one of its borders. And uh, the, um, the, 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 our platform, tents were on platforms on a boardwalk. And so each of our tents were distance from each other, two or 300 feet and connected by boardwalks. And we ate on a deck overlooking the lake and the hippos would be, and crocodiles uh, would be right out. Um, and the fish eagles would all be right out. And if you uh, go to the next us. slide, um, you'll see some of the, what she's talking about. We saw, we went on a boat ride and we saw the crocodiles about clothes and um, we saw some hippos that we did include and then tons of birds and um, a lot were on nest and and we saw them beating the young ones and there's a, a blue cheek beater up in the top right bottom left you can see one of their native kingfishers a pied kingfisher that we saw everywhere and um the um so this it, this was one of our favorite places we, we spent our last three days here and, and thoroughly enjoyed it and we did again get to uh, meet local communities and, and if you go to the next um we did do two final um community enrichment programs the first was um learned how they make banana beer and helping them with the process so that was planting the banana trees that was um peeling them helping mash them and they are, they have native African bees that produce honey. If you go to the next, uh, we did it was go. Our beekeeping. Um, it was kind of cut short because I was the first one going into the building, the bottom left, and I was stung by several bees. So um, we kind of ended up leaving. The lady in the orange shirt, Pegs, was allergic to bees, so we left. Um, John Webb asked about the size of the Goliath here into the Great Blue. It was definitely larger. larger. Um, and I thought they were, um, I thought it, I would say at least yeah. 25 to 30% larger. Not that big. I think, I think at least 20, 25% larger. We'll go with that. Just thinking about their bills and everything and just, yeah. So, um, the, uh, fitting one side, the other, um, you can go ahead and go to the next. Do we have one more? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, we also, um, had arranged ahead of time, um, the through um, the, I had mentioned that um, um, Tim and Lisa um, had do a lot of interpretive training for uh, park naturalists and historians around the world, and they've done training in Rwanda. In fact, they had done tra had trained John Marie, uh, who is our guide again in Rwanda with John Marie Wild, and uh, in that they had met. And again, Rwanda's recovery from the genocide is. They, the world has so much to learn from Rwanda and what they have done over the last 28 years to restore their environment, to educate their people, to unite their, their cultures. Um, again, uh, the, the complex history with traditional ethnic groups and with the social classes created um, by the colonization period. Um, and they reunited and had a reconciliation process 
um, to rebuild Rwanda. We are one Rwanda. We are all the same. And um, they did have a, have a truth telling. They, they did have courts, um, but they also said that this is going to be it. We're not going to get into this. We're not going to go into cycles of revenge or doing this. We are going to heal our country and rebuild it. And one of the things they have realized in both Rwanda and Tanzania is that to conserve these ecosystems and preserve all these species, you also have to involve the human communities. And the, you, the conservation programs and grants and practices won't work if they don't find a way to partner with the communities and benefit the human communities. And so that is why with the ecotourism, with people coming to the national parks, they've developed these um, social programs, encouraging people to visit and, and uh, see local crafts, see how things are made, get to know the community. And these are modest fee-based programs, but they share the wealth of tourism with all the locals um, instead of it going to a big tour company that's owned by someone in another country. And so these are very important part of their economic recovery, as well as their plant to, again, their goal to unite Rwanda and not divide, have it divided back up into this class's opportunities that this class of people don't. And we could probably in the presentation, go into the last slide. Um, everyone was, Friendly. They were all fr friendly, very all friendly, smiles. very entrepreneurial. <laughs> and um, this video kind of um, shows, shows that if you want to play this, these are young boys and they saw our, our land cruiser coming. Oh, I don't think you got the sound Yay. on. Woo, they, are they were singing too. <laughs> very good. Uh, they put down their big load of potatoes and other things that they were, uh, cassavas that they were carrying uh, to do that routine for us and were a joy to watch. And they were pretty much everyone that we met were like that. Friendly, um, always had big smiles. So it was great. Um, did anybody have any questions? You see the chat, there you go. I was wondering what you all, what you were feeling when you watched the gorillas. It, we actually had a gorilla behind us and we could hear it moving once in a while, uh, but we, we didn't know exactly because of the thick vegetation, you couldn't tell exactly where it was. And it was interesting uh, that we saw four uh, that were immediately, we knew there were more around us, but there were four that we could see clearly. The, the adult male, who's the leader of the group, was right he below us. He kept on eating and would knock down, what was it he was eating? Um, he, or, yeah, it's, a, it's a, like a, almost like a sugarcane stock type of plant. But he would grab very it starchy. and throw it down. And of course, it was really tall, so it would land on us. And our guides would be like, stop, stop, stop. Don't touch the food. And we're like, we're trying. And yeah. try to get out of the way. That was one of the rules is if he knocks it down, don't touch it because that's when he would get angry. You're trying to steal his food. Uh, but they're giant stalks of, of imagine like river cane or bamboo. Um, it's a vegetative plant that's very starchy that they that that's one of their favorite foods. Uh, but what was funny is he had two young offspring, probably a year or two old, uh, that were playing on a mound of vegetation beside him. And when a stalk would come their way, they would climb up it and then ride it down as it would fall with their weight. And so we also had to watch them run around and well, they would also climb to, up and uh, jump on down. each other and roll down, go back up, one would tackle the other. So it was also, I enjoyed watching the two young ones yeah. play. And there was a smaller female who was over um, to the right of the male. She was eating too. Um, they were, there was probably 12, 15 feet between them, uh, each minding their own business. And then that rustling back behind us suddenly parted the ways and came right between uh, the, in the middle of our group. And they limit the number, of, again, because of COVID, they had just started the gorilla treks back. Um, and you have more guides and porters with you than you have um, tourists coming to see this. Which uh, was good though, because yes. I needed my porter to carry my bag. 
because yeah it was very slippery and our and bags were heavy, heavy. <laughs> um and the porters were i have to say and there are female porters as well as men now uh we happen to have an all-male group but they split our group in half you, there's the maximum of eight can be in a group and uh eight tourists going with the group and again this is part uh, we all had to be covid tested uh before we were allowed near the gorillas because they can catch covid from us and so they were very very careful with those um the uh, the way parted right in the middle of our group and we we scooted, we're on a side of a cliff <laughs> basically a vegetated slippery vegetation it's misting That's uh, very slippery and we're kind of holding on to each other and the uh, another bigger female gorilla came through the middle and she was in the mood and, and another amorous. came and joined her it was like oh. you get it all by yourself and get to be by yourself so they came and just watched the male and the and male was, was kind of like, like i'm not interested tonight girls he was like, i'm, I'm gonna a take a nap and he just took a nap and then we left he literally <laughs> rolled over the other way and just laid down and it was like yeah not right now and you could tell we could talk <laughs> all night about the gorillas it was pretty oh. cool. um what about your necklaces? oh your, your necklace uh, yeah. I have one of the Maasai uh, necklaces on, and these actually, uh, we actually are, are um, se our, our second day there, our, our first day actually really out on safari uh, was International Women's Day, and Tanzania has a woman president, uh, incidentally, and so we thought that was really cool um, that we were in a nation with a woman president on International Women's Day, and they were celebrating. There were banners and stuff out around uh, Tanzania, and we didn't know it, but Gabby had actually um, arranged. There, there was a group of Maasai women who were having a crafting day in the picnic area of uh, the first um, uh, national park that we went to, and we went to the picnic area, and they came over and met with us, and Saying with us, and we had a little celebration of the women of that particular group of Maasai oh. uh, for International Women's Day, and then they had some of their crafts with them. And uh, so, these I, are wedding um, necklaces that uh, the, they, the women this shows that they're a married woman, and when they do their dance it pops up and down. And so they do a move with their shoulders that that has it go and it claps and has little jingles on it also. It's great. All right, one last question. Anyone? can unmute yourself if you wish. Jody, it's Joni. That was wonderful. Hi, thank hey. you. I, I recognize you. <laughs> it's great to see you. You too. Nice to meet you, you, Sarah. Thanks for, for tuning in. Thank you, Jody and Sarah. Exceptional. Um, we would Dr. highly recommend this to yeah. anyone going. And uh, uh, it was Especially a dream trip for guys. me. And I turned 60 this year. So it was my 60th birthday present to me. And um, I actually turned 37 while there. And oh. that last national park was my favorite. I spent my morning on a game drive, my afternoon sitting on the dog, watching um, basically the hippos and the birds fly by. And just, oh, I wasn't wow. going to do work, but it was just too amazing. So. Yeah. Great awesome. way to spend a birthday. It reminds awesome. me of my uh, trip to Kenya. I was also there for my birthday too. Oh, good. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for sharing those experiences with us. You, you two clearly are professional communicators who are passionate about communicating and sharing your stories. I really appreciate Amen. that. Well, th there's <laughs> so much more that we could share, but we would encourage you to plan a safari or, or an adventure anywhere near or far. We enjoy exploring here in Arkansas and going birding, wildlife watching right here in our own backyard. Uh, but um, this was a trip of a lifetime and, and I would highly recommend it. And I would recommend finding local guides to take you out and, and having those community experiences. Um, and, uh, and again, that really makes sure just like we encourage people to eat local and try local things um, that, that that's so important for local economies and for conservation. <laughs> Well said. Yep. And well said. Uh, next month, Karen Holiday will be sharing scenes from her trip to Antarctica and Ooh. South America. <laughs> so we'll be going on another grand adventure. So tune in for that. Very this good. Is great. Great.